Good morning and welcome to Grace. Happy Mother's Day. Actually, my mom is joining us in right now, listening in. So I want to tell you, Mother, I love you. And thank you for joining us this morning. Um, my wife is and always has been a wonderful woman to me and my kids. But before my wife and I met, there was another woman who had already been precious to me. She was there for my formidable years as I grew from a child to a young adult. She was always available, and especially when the hard days came, and when it felt like the whole world was against me, when there was no one else on my side, she welcomed me with a forgiving embrace. Of course, I think you know I am speaking about my very own dog, Keisha. What a wonderful dog she was. She was part Keisha and part German. Sh no, I'm just teasing. <laughs> that is not true. My mother. My mother is the other special woman in my life and still is today. Not all of us can say this, but my mom is a true born-again believer. And like the rest of us, she's had her ups and downs. She's had struggles and times where she praises our Lord and times where she had questioned our Lord. And it's never the kind of questioning where it's like doubting the faith, does God even exist? But rather questions like, why God? And uh, why do I have to go through the hard things that I do? And actually, it is much like the type of questioning that we find from biblical characters, such as King David, uh, which is recorded in, uh, in quite lengthy details that we went through in the book of Psalms. However, just recently, my mom did do some reflection of her own struggles, and it is interesting to see her results uh, from the reflection of my mother's reflections, who has a proper perspective in her life wrought by a steadfast, prayerful relationship with Christ. And then even here in Kingsford, Michigan, last Saturday, I saw selfless service as people served and still continue today serving our church. Uh, so with prayerful consideration, I felt it best to pause from our expository journey through the book of Mark and just for a moment and take this time this morning to zoom in on one prayer, the prayer of a particular selfless mother, Hannah. So with that being said, I want us to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting in verse 10, and consider this prayer uh, of a happy mother. 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting at verse 10. Scripture says this, She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, and only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put uh, your wine away from you. Verse 15, But Hannah answered, No, my Lord. I am a woman a troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regret your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go into the place, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Verse 19, they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for which she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. The man Elkanah and his household went up to offer the, to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she had said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, had said to her, 
do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Verse 24, and she went, or, and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an FF of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought to him to the house of the Lord and uh, at Silo. And the child was young. Verse 25, then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought uh, the child to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. And we'll stop here at verse 27. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. What a wonderful prayer. Essentially, what we have here is this heartfelt prayer of a woman who would have normally stayed behind the scenes if it wasn't for the prompting of the Holy Spirit uh, to the, the author of this book, of Samuel, uh, to in, include this passage. And this account of a mother's prayer is answered here in Scripture. So essentially, we are looking at this woman, not only this woman, but this mother who had care for her child. And as Scripture tells us in the New Testament to obey your mother and your father, I want to look at this to not only obey, but also to honor your mother and your father. So let's go ahead and look a little bit closer at this passage. Uh, and you might be sitting here this morning thinking, uh, well, what does this passage have to do with me? Maybe you're either watching at home or in the sanctuary right now, and you're like, I am not a mom. <laughs> or maybe you're saying, my mom is no longer living. Or, you know, I'm not even a woman. Well, this passage this morning is actually for everybody because it's a good example of a faithful God and how he answers prayer and how a caring, prayer-filled life influences others that applies to really all of us here. So I want to look a little bit closer as we dive in this morning. The first point is happy mothers pray for their children. You know, in this passage, verse 10, verse 12, verse 13, verse 20, and even 27, they all declare the act of praying. Sad moms, on the other hand, either they pray with selfish motives or maybe they don't pray at all. And they might wonder why God won't bless them. And it has to do with their prayer life or lack thereof. The Apostle James actually has something to say about that in... Uh, James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3 says, You desire and you do not have. You murder and you are filled with envy and you are not able to obtain. You fight and quarrel. You don't have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives in order that you might spend it on your pleasures. So this is what goes on with a sad mom. But on a happy mom, it's much different. And perhaps you've heard the saying, well, when we have a care, does God care? And who can rival the care of a mother, really? A mother's care for her own child. But if we take it to prayer to ease the cares and concerns, it's as if when in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he might exalt you at the right time, casting all your cares on him, because he cares for you. God's love surpasses a mother's love for her child. So think about that. The next time you pray and you ask, does God care? The sad mom, she must drop her pride and come to Yahweh. That's God the Father's name, Yahweh, in prayer. And when she does, she will be happy. And well, how do I know that for sure? Well, listen to Yahweh's words for yourself in the Psalms. Psalm 91, verse 15. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. This is a prayer. And this is or not only a prayer, but this is a promise. And when a mom first tastes and see that the Lord is good, this sparks passion to continue strong. And so that's why I want to look at happy mothers pray with passion. We see in verse 10 of our uh, thing, she was deeply distressed. 
and she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Well, passion naturally leads to tears, and she wept. But passion is also what leads to pleasing the Lord. She vows this vow in the next verse, verse 11. She says, she made a vow and said, O Yahweh of hosts, if you will look with compassion on the misery of your female servant and will remember me and not forget your female servant, here's the deal, and I will give to you, uh, to your female servant, a male child, sorry, excuse me, she's still continuing on here. Uh, this is the, the promise here. Then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life, and a razor will never pass over his head. That was part of the Nazarite vow, actually, about not shaving your head. But uh, Hannah appears really here to be bargaining with God. But is that right to do? Is it appropriate to bargain with the Almighty God? Well, it is clear throughout Scripture that God wants people to have an authentic personal relationship with Him, and one that involves expression of true feelings in a spirit of like a give-and-take kind of relationship. So if one could ask certain things of the Lord in faith, one could also promise him something in return. And so Hannah, this godly woman who profoundly believed that God was powerful and he was good, she had suffered humiliation probably at this point and insults possibly for years due to her childlessness. It was seen as a curse from God not to have a child. And it, she was pleading desperately with God to give her this child. Her offer was far superior than that of uh, the pagans in the pagan religions uh, who would sa sacrifice perhaps even a child as a morbid gift of their deity. So she is sacrificing her child to service where the pagans were sacrific sacrificing their child to death. And Hannah offered to give the son she requested as a living sacrifice dedicated to uh, dedicating his whole life, his lifelong service to the Lord. And so the Lord was not really necessarily obligated and had to follow her vow, but he did have the right to accept her offer, and he did. He accepted it. She made a vow, and this is really the only woman, especially looking in the Old Testament, the only woman recorded in the Old Testament as having uh, made a vow and then keeping that vow to God. And I think what this is a picture of is God wants zealous, passionate people. But there is this measure of solitude that also pleases God. And uh, happy mothers keep promises. And she kept her word. If we were to jump down to verse 28 now, she says, I in turn have lent him to Yahweh. As long as he lives, he is lent to Yahweh. Then they worshiped Yahweh there. But... In her keeping this vow as a warning, don't make promises that you cannot keep. The Bible does warn about this. If we were to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we see this stern warning. When you vow a vow to God and do, uh, do not delay paying for it, he's saying, uh, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. He's saying it's safer. Don't vow to God if you don't intend or you think there's a chance you cannot pay it. You only vow to God what you can keep 100% when you keep your word. But happy mothers, they pray always. In the New Testament, in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul concludes his book by listing out a string of imperatives or commands at the end of his uh, book here. And one of them, in verse 17 happens to be this short pray without ceasing verse. And this is quite the demand. It's three words, but it is quite a demand. How can we really pray without ceasing at all? Well, just like we see with Hannah, pray. Pray as you walk through your day. Pray as you're driving to and from your home. Pray as you reflect on things. Your thoughts should be intermingled with actual prayers. And really the differences between thoughts and prayers is your thoughts are your thoughts that you keep for yourself, but your prayers is what you're offering to the Lord. 
And so I want you to focus on the first phrase here, actually in verse 19 of our passage in 1 Samuel. Verse 19, they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house. And I think this is really the central key to happiness. Praying always without ceasing, but starting also early each morning. It takes discipline to wake up early in the morning simply to uh, spend time to be a disciple of God's. And it's an all-day event, and it starts early. Uh, plus, persistence yields results. And Jesus says this, Luke chapter 11, verse 5, and he said to them, which one of you who has a friend would go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. Verse 7, and he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Basically, he's saying the more you beg, the more likely out of impudence he'll get up and uh, do what you ask him. Then this is what Jesus says. This is beautiful. I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. To the one who knocks, it will be open. He's saying, you come to Christ, and you beg in prayer, and he will give it to you. And how much better is God than a friend that you have to nag? And really, this should make us smile. I have a famous saying, of course, you guys know, if you haven't been smiling yet, now's the time to smile. Prayers are effectual. In happy mothers, they pray believing. Hannah's prayer brought results, and yours can too. It says this in verse 20, And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. God answered her prayer, and even the name of her first son bore witness to that for his whole life. But happy mothers, they also pray privately, and if we look back at verse 12, we see this. Verse 12, it says, She continued praying before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth, and Hannah was speaking in her heart, and only her lips moved, and her voice was not her. It's private prayer, closet prayer. In this closet prayer, as it's called, or private prayer, it's truly an, ac or an accurate barometer of your spiritual health. When no one else is around, how do you pray? Or maybe the question should be, if no one else is around, do you pray? And when and if you pray alone, is it long? Is it fervent? Is it reverent? Or are those quality prayers only reserved for when others are watching? Sometimes for some people, it's easy to pray in public and make a show of their prayer but their private prayer life lacks. And for others, it's the exact opposite. Uh, I have seen where people's private prayer life uh, is just, it's immaculate. It, it makes me jealous. But then they don't pray publicly. And really, God wants us to do both. We are to be praying without ceasing. But uh, happy mothers have fervent closet prayer time. And that's the point. So happy mothers, they pray for their chi uh, children. And moms usually vow to themselves to make their children's futures better than what they uh, lived through. And they should. And it's because happy mothers ready their children for their futures. And I want to see this in Scripture in verse 23 now in our passage for Samuel Elkanah. Her husband said to her, do, you do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And I'm reminded of talking with a woman at work once about teaching their children about God and uh, spending that time readying them for a relationship with God. And as I was talking about this, she told me how she would never teach her child anything about religion. And the reason is she wanted her child to grow up and discover religion on their own. And so she didn't want to force her children 
to worship one particular God, but she thought she'll let her decide on her own what she would believe and what she wouldn't believe about God or gods or no God at all. And I replied, that sounds admirable. And I told her, well, maybe I should do the same with my kids when it comes to street drugs. According to your educational philosophy, I told her, it would make sense for me not to tell them anything about illegal drugs as to allow them to discover what they want to believe about what drugs do to you. After all, I wouldn't want to force my children to do anything legal that could save their lives. Obviously, I was being facetious with that answer. <laughs> I did give that answer. That is a true story, by the way. But how much more important is eternal life? And a, a happy mother prepares her child for service to God. And we see this in Scripture. If we are to turn to chapter 2, verse 19, again, this is talking about Hannah. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to, or take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifices. Now Samuel's gotten a little older. He can be in the, uh, in the tabernacle. And as his mother, she was aware that he could not yet do useful service in the tabernacle. He was still young. So she undertook the expense of supplying him with the proper wearing apparel for the tabernacle. And this was to prepare him for future service to the Lord in the tabernacle. Just as to today, today happy mothers prepare their kids to serve God. What a care of a mother. And this really does sound like someone I know who's listening online right now. She prepared me for service to my God. Happy mothers, they pray for their children. Happy mothers, they ready their children for their future. And then finally, happy mothers praise Yahweh. Several years ago, there was a story, this one medical missionary, he was captured by bandits in China. I think actually this was more towards the earlier 19th century. And these bandits, they told him that he was to be shot at a certain gorge that was 10 minutes away. And so as this missionary tells how terrible a fear and helplessness came over him at the thought of such a death, so far away from his native country as they brought him to where they were going to shoot him, it was away from his family and his friends. But he did have enough strength as they were taking him away, uh, enough strength to pray. And he records his prayer. He says, this is my prayer. My Lord, my God, have mercy on me and give me strength for this trial. Take away all fear. And if I have to die, let me die like a man. And he said, instantly, his terrible fear began to disappear. And by the time they had reached that gorge that was 10 minutes away from his capture, where he was to be shot, he felt perfectly calm and unafraid. And at the last moment, these bandits decided to relent. And his life was spared, and he eventually escaped their captivity. But in the days that followed, full of danger and suffering, the memory of this experience was cherished more and more by this missionary. And so he records, he says, My own life will have failed in the most critical moment, but not my faith. And he goes on to say, The knowledge that I could depend on a power greater than my own, the one that had not failed me, in that crisis, sustained me in such a wonderful way to the very end of my captivity. And then he, he, he actually concludes this, uh, this journal, and he says, What ingratitude would it be in me not to proclaim this kind of power? And I think, what a beautiful picture. The power of prayer, and what a tragedy. He calls it a, a ingratitude, uh, not being thankful, to not proclaim the power of this kind of prayer. And it was easier after that incident for him to praise Yahweh. And in our passage, Hannah recognizes God for answering her prayer. And so she starts her praise, verse 27. This is what she says. 
For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my, my petition that I made to him. She gave God the credit for the answer to her prayers. And why did she do this? Well, we call on God to find out. Psalm 50, verse 15, has a, a beautiful promise. This is God speaking through the psalmist. He says, call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. Yahweh will answer your prayer, and you will glorify him. Well, finally, we see here in chapter 2 of our passage how she praised God for her salvation. Verse 1, Hannah prayed and said, My heart exults in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. That my horn is exalted phrase, horn in the Hebrew, karen, it symbolizes strength and might. My might is exalted. My strength is lifted up in the Lord, is what she's saying. So we get to the end of the sermon and we say, so what? Well, so today, place your faith in Jesus as your Savior. Trust that the guilt of your sins can be transferred to Jesus and you can receive the full forgiveness of all sins. Then you could pray a prayer like Hannah. And if you have not trusted in Jesus, today is the day. I beg you to do so. And I want to honor the mothers out there that just like we saw with Hannah, have fervent, effectual prayers. We do indeed have something to shout about. Psalm 32, verse 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, you upright in heart. The power of prayer influences us in a way which lasts a lifetime, if not eternity. I want to leave you with this last illustration where Alexander the Great, he entertained kings and nobles in the court of of Persia, and he appeared wearing only those garments which had been woven for him by his mother, Olympias, who was the daughter of a chieftain, the wife of a king, and the mother of a conqueror. And long ago, we usually discard the garments that were made for or perhaps bought uh, for us by our loving mother's hands. And yet, in a certain sense, as to our own life and character, we are still wearing the garments that were woven to us or woven for us by our mothers. And so in conclusion, this record of Hannah's prayer not only influenced the prophet priest Samuel, who greatly influenced Saul and David, which led to the influencing or influencing of course of the nation Israel, but also influenced us by extension today. God faithfully answers the persistent, faith-filled prayers of his children, regardless if you're a mother. So the question is begged, are you praying? Are we a prayer-filled church? If you want to see awesome things happen, beg the Lord in prayer. I know with all my heart that is the result of my mom's faithful prayers in her relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, that I came to Christ. And it is also one of the reasons I'm standing here before you today. And what influenced me most about my own mother is how, even in the worst of times, instead of blaming God, she prayed to God. And now I know I could always turn to my God and pray. So keep praying, mothers. Mom, thank you. Keep praying. And keep praising our Lord for your own mothers. After all, even if your mother out there happened to be a cruel, unbelieving woman, without her bearing you, you wouldn't be here today. And so there is some sense where we could still honor even that kind of mother. And for those of us that have a godly mom, let's use this day to praise and honor her. 
Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for my mom. I thank you for you placing her in my life. That she prepared the way, even as we've been speaking the last couple of weeks, of John the Baptist. She prepared the way for Jesus in my own heart. Lord, I'm eternally grateful. Lord, let this day be honoring to you and to my mother. Let us exalt the godly woman as she prays. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I'll let you guys go so you can enjoy your Mother's Day and enjoy time with your mother, or if your mother's no longer on this side of eternity, to spend time with your daughters, your wives, and to take the time to praise the Lord together in your family. And if you have not accepted the Lord as your Savior, there's no prayer out there that can help you. And so I invite you today to be the day of salvation. If you're listening online, pray the prayer of salvation. Pray that the Lord would enter into your heart, that you will fully repent of living life your own way, and you'll turn to live life the way he designed you for, a relationship with him. Then you can honor your mothers and you can honor God just as he sees fit. Thank you. We have one last song to sing. Let's go ahead and stand and sing together.